Um, this space could design be done in MATLAB or Octave, um, and there's some, some data sets as well. Um, so, and it's, um, it's worth 20 points again, so it feels like we're 10, but this, but I hope the steps are pretty much um, laid out in much more detail. Um, so hopefully it's not too it's not too challenging. So you can you know focus on the project and not have to, have to worry too much about it. Um, um, so the other thing I want to point out is that um, there's a um, there's a talk tomorrow at on twelve fifteen. Um, it's um, it's in this building, but the other that in the tower part of the third floor. If you walk out of elevators, go all the way to the back on the third floor, you'll find it. And so it's, um, so we had big data social, so I think it's going to talk about some issues with dealing with these, um, these graphs of connections between people. And if you have a really large amount of this data, how do you use this to kind of, um, um, how do you understand this interactive and social part of our thing, this, this graph part of the data we're kind of uh, try to explore structure and mine it for, you know, uh, um, um, for the sorts of information encoded in it. And so, um, starting in um, two lectures, we're going to start on the last part of the of the semester, which is going to be on, on the analysis of graphs. Um, and so this might be a good review for this. But I haven't seen the talk, so I don't know exactly what it is. But, uh, but this guy's a pretty big name in databases. He's written um, some of the textbooks, and he's you know had lots of great students and stuff. So um, I expect this to be to be a really good talk. Um, okay, so um, today we're gonna for the lecture today and the one on Monday we're gonna be talking uh, mainly about noise and how you deal with noise and data. Um, so these topics are much more. Uh, much more abstract than um, the stuff we were doing before and the stuff we'll do after. We'll more be talking about kind of just the modeling aspects of data, and not as much on the, on the um, not as much on the algorithms or on the the kind of uh, the analysis of the error in them. So um, I'll, I'll try and make it uh, more interactive and get you to kind of think through the different challenges. So, um, uh, but it's also um, not going to be as as um, structured, and so before we move on, I want to make um, so I want to um, maybe um, the other thing I realized is that um, the lecture on Monday we talked about the lasso, and there's a lot of information about that, and so if you have any questions about that algorithm, I can spend some time kind of going over questions about that or anything more detail. Um, so what? Um, so what people think of the lasso? Is this something you would um, you would try doing, or is it more complicated and it's not worth it? More complicated. It's too complicated, you think? Yeah, so you wouldn't actually. So, um, so you you wouldn't implement it yourself, but if you had if you had uh, some code, if you had a if you had a package um, like Weka or something, and you could run. The lasso, or you could um, run ridge regression. Would you consider doing it? Yeah. Okay. So I uh, so I didn't ask you to do it in the in the homework because either it would be kind of uh, going and downloading some some software package that could do it for you, or it would take a lot of time to implement everything carefully. Um, but I um, I actually think it's a really neat concept because not only is it is it um, protecting against uh, noise in your data, but it's also kind of picking out which of the parameters are the ones which are important and which are the ones you can ignore. Um, and so it's kind of magically doing these, both these things at once. And so people have been, you know, in the last 10 years really, people have been exploring a lot of the, um, the different applications and variants of this algorithm. So I, I, ex I expect it to be, um, is it, it, to be more and more an important part of understanding and, and finding structure and data in the years to come. So, um, all right. So, um, okay. So, so, so if you have questions on that, then we'll talk about um, noise. Um, and 
So um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to try and classify the types of noise you would find in data into three basic types. And these kind of, um, these depending on what type of noise you're, um, you're worried about, it may factor in this sort of technique you'll use to try and deal with that noise, right? So, um, so the first type may be um, spurious readings. Uh, um, um, so the idea behind this is uh, um, when you're collecting data or when someone else collected data, you're presented on um, this large amount of data, it was collected through some process, right? Um, so you are, um, so say you're a data scientist, right? And you're sitting here, and so what happens is um, you have access to this data, right? And what you want to do is is take this data and and output some model, right? But this data, um, this data came from some process, right? Um, so. So there's some underlying process, and somehow there was there was something which is uh, which is taking the, observing this process, and and is so somehow you're collecting this data from this process. Okay, so this could be that um, like there are a bunch of customers who are accessing a website, and this is happening all the time, and so um, you're getting. Um, uh, maybe access um, to maybe 10% of those customers, right? So some of the people for, in this class are working with Twitter, and you can have access to maybe 1% of uh, uh, like 1% of the Twitter feed, right? So you have all these tweets, right? And what you're getting is only 1% of these tweets, right? Or it could be that they're, you know, maybe Twitter is trying to capture, you know, the thought process of all of humanity, right? Um, or something grand like that. But it's, it's not doing all that, it's just certain people happen to be uh, the ones who are willing to post on Twitter and they post what they're thinking, right? So, so the grand dream was, you know, trying to capture the thoughts of everyone and, and something like that, but you're not observing all of this process. Um, so another example may be that you're, t you're trying to understand, um, um, like you're um, trying to understand like a protein. And so, um, and you're understanding the, the energy nature of this protein. Um, and so a protein is, is this grouping together of these, of these atoms. And depending on the configuration of the atoms, they're kind of connected in a certain way, but, they're, um, but they, could, they could be twisted a little bit, and there could be other molecules nearby. And depending on the structure, there are certain, there's a, a certain amount of energy in the system. And so the, and the, the protein is not one configuration, it's this distribution of configurations, and for each distribution, you can measure the amount of energy. And so each of these measurements gives you some element in your data set. Right? And so then you're sitting, looking at this data, and you're trying to understand something more, you're trying to understand some model of what this, how this structure of this data works. Right? So there's some underlying process here, and you're only getting some observation of it. Okay? And then your job is to, um, it, it, is to somehow create this model of this data. Okay, so, so with that in mind, one of the types of noise or air that you can get in this process is when, when you're taking a reading, and um, so there are a whole bunch of these things, and it could be that one of these things, something goes wrong. Right, you're, um, so, so, uh, um, so another application where this maybe is easier to see is that if you're uh, looking at the output of a robot that's trying to navigate some space, 
is maybe he's maybe taking these, he, it's got this laser rangefinder, or it's taking these pictures, trying to figure out where it is, why it's a slope environment. And so usually, this, say the laser rangefinder, it's very accurate, it gives you a distance to an object in a certain direction. But sometimes if you're, if I'm shooting it right this way, it, it, the laser might go through the glass, and it's gonna bounce outside. But if it's a little bit off, it'll hit some impurity in the glass, and it's gonna bounce back to me. And so you're gonna get these differences in the readings, and you're gonna sometimes get something that's grossly different than what um, you'd expect. Or if, if also this laser rangefinder, if you're very far away, it hit a speck of dust in the air. Um, I was, I was, uh, I had some colleagues who were working to, to try and map out the ocean floor, the, the depth of the ocean floor. And they had this, this boat going back and forth in the ocean, shooting this laser straight down to, to try and get the depth. And occasionally, they would get these weird like spikes in the depth. And they wonder what it was. And it was schools of fish that were swimming in the ocean. And so they had to do all this manual stuff to try and factor out these schools of fish. Right, so these are these, on these spurious, these spurious readings. And so these will t typically um, be what we think of as outliers. Um, and I'll talk more on Monday about kind of uh, fairly general ideas and techniques of how to deal with, uh, with outliers. So, and th this, is, this is more of a problem than it probably used to be. Um, and this is because we're getting much larger data sets now, and the process of collecting is becoming much more and more automated. It used to be when statisticians, you know, like Fisher, like, um, like 100 years ago, were looking at data, they collected every single data point. They maybe got like 100 data points. And each, each one of these, these data points, you know, they took great care to make sure they got correct. And if, if, when they're correcting, if something went wrong, they probably noticed it and didn't, didn't actually, um, you know, take that piece of data, right? You could filter out by hand because you were involved in the collection of processing that data and collecting it, that you, you most often understood if it was an outlier before it happened. Now, you always have to be careful because maybe it wasn't really an outlier and this leads to other issues, but you're often able to kind of just, just eyeball it and see that this is really an outlier. I should, I should throw it away somehow. And so for, for, for a long time, this, people spoke about liars, but they weren't really a problem because you could usually throw them out by hand, right? So if you have, if you have data um, that looks like this, and there's one data point here, you can just look at it, it's two dimensions, you say, this one's probably an outlier, right? Maybe you can do something, and we'll talk tomorrow about how to, on Monday, how to, how to filter, filter this out, but in higher, higher dimensions, um, you know, you can't just plot it and see that as an outlier. Everything, you know, without really being able to see it is harder to tell us, right? So, um, so we'll talk more about outliers tomorrow, or on, on, on Monday. Um, okay, so the other way, um, something else which I, Um, something else which I'll call measurement error is, you know, it's, it's still affecting this process. Um, but it's, it's more, it's not something that's really far away, but it's that when you're collecting the process, this is not perfect. You're not perfectly observing something. So this could be as simple as you've only collected data up to a certain precision, and so there were uh, um, just rounding errors in your data. Um, so I've, I've looked at data where um, it, was, it was a bunch of patients from a hospital and, and they wanted to kind of obscure the location of the patients so they, they, um, they gave their longitude and, and latitude. They're trying to find like spatial anomalies or something. But, um, but, but they rounded it to a, to a certain precision um, because they didn't want to give away their exact location. You didn't want to know which one of them had cancer. Um, um, for instance, right? So, so, so there may be some rounding error with some measurement error. It could also be that when you're when you're when you're sensing something, you know, it's it's not an exact process, and 
and this observation may not be reality. And often this results in some small amount of error that you tolerate. Right? If this was the data, it could have been that there's actually some generating process which actually looks like this line, but because of some measurement error, the data points is not actually on this line. There's some small amount of error. Right, and so, um, so, uh, so even if you filter out the outliers, you still may have to deal with this error. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about this today. So, we're, um, so if you don't, um, if you don't deal with this properly, um, um, it can lead to overfitting. Um, so an overfitting is when you fit some model which is which is more complicated than it should be, um, and and we'll we'll talk about you know some the standard ways how to how to deal with this. Um, okay, and then the the third type of error, and this is maybe or third type of noise um, is still. a little bit different is uh, background data. And so this could be where, um, let's say you're trying to measure, um, let's say the, um, let's say I'm trying to measure the um, performance of, of the people in the class who grew up in the US, right? And so, but I have, I have lots of other people in the class who did grow up in the US. And so this, this data, uh, so I have to tease out uh, 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 which data is the right data. And sometimes the, the data which I don't, I don't want to deal with is obscuring stuff in the background. And so this isn't really noise, but sometimes it gets mixed in with, with the data that you do want to look at. And so you have to kind of think about it and deal with this. And so this is, um, this is sometimes harder to deal with and this will, um, so this this kind of thing also comes up, uh, but is is kind of a, is is a different type of noise than these other types of noise. Um, so it, it's it's also one of the other examples when we talked about the heavy hitters problem. There was we were looking for um, these denial of service attacks, and that's when there was really a large amount of traffic. Um, say going to one IP address. But there's still other traffic that's coming to the router which is supposed to be going to certain IP addresses. Maybe even including the one that's being attacked. Right, so we're trying to find this, uh, this, this, one, this one IP address which is being attacked while there's all this other data in the background. And this can kind of get in the way. Right, so when, when we're dealing with these, with this, um, when we're dealing um, with the Misha Greaves algorithm, right? Every time we saw so many of these IP addresses, we need to, we subtracted um, one count from everything, and this included the count from the um, for, from the actual thing we were keeping track of, right? We needed to do this to get the guarantees to work in the algorithm, and so this background data was kind of interfering here. Um, and so when you're finding something despite the background data, then this is then this is sometimes called anomaly. Um, um, anomaly detection. So here, you're not finding the background data, you're finding everything else, right? The stuff that's not the background data. And so then, this background data is noise that's getting in the way. And sometimes, you group some of the background data into your anomaly, and sometimes you don't see part of your anomaly because it's obscured by the background. Right, so if you had a, so you have a baseline distribution which looks like this, and then there's some anomalous distribution that looks like this on top of it. If you sum together these two distributions, you might think it looks like, um, like this, and then you might say, well, the anomaly is all the data here, but actually, part of this anomaly is actually the background data, right? And um, or maybe the anomaly 
or maybe you said the anomaly was actually inside this, this thinner region and you missed part of it because it was obscured by the background data. So, so, so these are the three, um, kind of the three main ways I, I um, think about noise. And you kind of, and generally you need to deal with them separately. Sometimes you can deal with the spurious data in the same way you deal with the measurement. Um, but we'll talk about on Monday a different way how to deal with this. Um, this this background data, you're probably really, you know, the, the thing is something here might be part of either of these distributions. So you could you could try and say, well, there's a background distribution and then there's this and try and factor them out. But one of these data points, it could be in either one of these and you don't know which is which. So it's, sometimes there's, there's really nothing you can do about classifying individual data points. Um, but you can, you know, you can try and say something about the, the, the number of these data points. But, so this one will be much more vague how to deal with, and I won't talk about any, any, any sort of magical um, solutions for this one. Um, okay. Um, so does this make sense? Are there any kind of things of, types of noise you had in mind that didn't fit into any of these, these categories? Yeah. So is this is this boring? Is this you know, okay? Right. Yeah. This is a little bit tangential, but um, I, I I I had recently we, we had a bunch of data at the hospital system that had a bunch of patient health information, PHI stuff that we had yeah. to identify, and um, it seems like I think one of the main challenges what of it is we kind of de-identified it and verified that like it couldn't be traced back. Is we we had to make sure that it was it was valid that we didn't have. I guess we didn't have spurious readings in there. That we didn't we didn't like corrupt the data as it came over. We were able to to, to keep it the same. I was just wondering if, if um, well, I guess my question or is what was my question? My my question was uh, if, if if you noticed uh, if, if this is if this is a pretty big topic with with the identify data and making sure that uh, that there's not any measurement errors or spurious readings or anything like that. If you've encountered any. Yeah, well, um, so, so, I'll, um, so I actually talk a little bit about this. So I had a topic which I took out of the class just because I want to talk about other things called, um, um, called differential um, privacy. And the idea is, is a way of, uh, um, 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 how to de-identify data so you can still preserve certain properties while while not being able to identify individual patients. And there's kind of a long kind of winding history of how people have looked at privacy and data. And there's like like for instance, there's this there's this very hot topic called k anonymity, where you couldn't distinguish anyone up to k other other people k other people. So you couldn't reveal enough information so someone's traits, so the traits you reveal could be at, at least k different people. Um, but then people showed, well, party A was releasing this data, and then party B was releasing this other data, which seemed completely different. And when you join them together, then you could figure out who everyone was. And so these, these, these techniques weren't really sound, right? So for instance, there, um, there are two big kind of, uh, the, 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 uh, um, there are two big kind of um, interesting things that happened here. One is there was probably about 15 years ago, the, uh, uh, um, the governor of Massachusetts decided they would want people to work, do research on, uh, um, on all of the hospital records in the state of Massachusetts. And what they did is they took out everyone's name, they, they left like their their medical records, their zip code, the something like the date of their birth, but not the year, or something like that, or maybe the month and and, and their gender, and and so, so they thought that this was, or maybe the the rough age bracket, but not but um, but not the actual date of their birth, and so they thought this was on on the say was on on de-anonymized or. Almost anonymized, 
And then so a PhD student went and said, huh, you know, I bet I could figure out what's going on. And they, and they cross-referenced the medical records with the addresses um, and ages of all of the public officials in Massachusetts. And this included the governor. And so this grad student figured out the medical records of the governor and printed them out and, and sent them to him in mean, the mail. Um, and, and so they kind of made a point that this, this wasn't really working. Um, the other thing you might have heard of is the Netflix challenge. Yeah. Right? Netflix released all of this, all of this data about people's recommendations on movies, but they, they, they took out the names and they figured there's so many people you wouldn't, won't be able to identify them. Well, someone figured out that a lot of people who rated a lot of movies on Netflix also rated them on IMDb. And those people, um, the, those people you know, had, had IDs associated with them. And so this should be fine. If they made a public on, 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 on IMDb, then it should be a problem. But the thing is, some people rated movies on Netflix that they didn't want to make public, right? So maybe they like the certain the certain class of movies which you know they they watch in the privacy of their own home, but but not you know uh, they wouldn't raise it on the internet. And so they were able to make the connection and say, huh, this user also watched these other movies. And uh, so they were they were planning to us um, they're planning to a second Netflix challenge, but this kind of Th this analysis came out right before they were going to do that, so they decided that maybe they shouldn't do that. Um, so I, I think it would have been there would have been a lot more talk about this if they had done another challenge. But this was kind of <coughs> somewhat swept under the rug, I guess, because they did do a second one. But that was too bad actually, because the first one had all this great data and really kind of focused a lot of research on this. So okay, so this, what is the state of art? in releasing data. So the idea is that you've got some data set which has private information, and what you do is, is each uh, data point two, um, it, it, um, each data point P, what you do is you release this P prime, which is equal to P plus a small amount of Laplacian noise. Um, so it's not Gaussian noise, it's Laplacian, which looks kind of like this instead of whereas, whereas the Gaussian is like this. And there's some technical reasons why you want to use the Laplacian instead of the Gaussian. But you release this instead over certain attributes. And then what you can claim is that you, you can't, um, if you do this properly, then you can't identify the individual value of this data point. So this data point can represent an individual person or an individual record. Um, and then what you want to be able to do is to ask queries. Um, so you have some family of queries, right? If you take some query out. So, so a query might, so it could be that you use data points. And you want to ask what fraction of the people are inside of this rectangle query, right? This could be the height and the, this could be the, um, the height and, and the weight of your, of your patients. Right? And so this could be all the people who have height in this range and weight in this range. And you want to know about the right count. And so you could get some somewhat accurate estimations of these counts even after you um, did this transformation on the data set. If you looked at this, you know, if you had this P prime on the data set. Um, so, but you could recover the exact location of any individual point. Now, some of them are going to be very close to where they were before. Some of them would have moved a lot. Um, so still, if so, th there are certain guarantees you can make on these, but these are fairly qualified guarantees, right? If you if you release this data, if you cross-reference it with another data set, you still may be able to be pretty good guess of who was released because a lot of the data is not going to be moved too much. Um, so there's there's a. But this is kind of the state of the art. Some people um, are very much kind of pushing, and they've, they've built entire systems. I think um, there's a guy at Microsoft Research called Frank McSherry, um, who's, who's built a, there, there are other instances of this, but he's built some actual system which will take your data and will 
um, kind of release it. But what they don't want to do is they don't want to actually release all this data. What they do is they present you a user interface, and you can ask queries on this data. Um, and if you ask too many queries, you can eventually kind of figure out too much stuff. So, but they'll release the query answers to the internal representation of this data that's been stored like this with with bash or noise added on to it. And if they limit the number of queries in the right way, then the data stays open. And so maybe the sort of queries you might want to ask are going to be enough. You know, it, it, just asking these queries will be enough to kind of handle the data, uh, to do the sort of processing you want to do. Um, this, this may or may not be the case, right? Um, but this is kind of the, what people think is the state of art. There are also plenty of people who think that this is going to fail. Someone's going to find a flaw in this or a reason why it's not useful the same way all the other techniques are. Um, the, the idea behind it is based on the number of queries you would need may need to be exponentially large in order to recover error up to a certain precision, or exponentially large with respect to the amount of error in a, in a, in a, in a certain way. Um, so it seems like the computation, there's a computational bottleneck in a, versus the usefulness. It won't be useful enough to release this thing, but at least they have some sort of guarantees if you have these strict standards. But what if you have multiple accounts to Microsoft Research and then you do, if X is the limit for the query, you do X query from each account, so then you don't have Well, to what they do is they keep track of the total number of queries from all accounts. Right? After queries, well, so many queries have been made, maybe they can even make those queries public and say, here are past queries people have asked. Okay. And then you can say, okay, either I need to find another past query which was close enough, or I'll, you know, I run out of queries, right? Okay. There's, the, the, you make a very small niche data set and then do tons of queries on that. Right, so, so you could easily do a denial service attack on this, right? You just throw a bunch of queries at it, eventually it says, you're out of queries, now no one else can ask anything, right? Because the data's out there. So that's one of the limitations of this, uh, this sort of thing. Yeah, actually, I would present one of the identification software. So uh, I actually feel you uh, like in a practical experience because we were uh, totally convinced that we did a very good job, me, my professor, everyone. But then when, the, when, when we went to the doctors who actually treated those patients, they could pin, pinpoint like that. Yeah. So what we did was suppose if someone was suffering from breast cancer or tongue cancer, we made it like a cancer or something. So instead of uh, portraying that as cancer, if we uh, change that uh, data from cancer to let's say arthritis. So will that be a noise? How, how do we consider like what what are we going to consider that as? Yes, I think a false information. So th th this is this is, a lot of this work is from the theory community, and they say you have data points that has some sort of numerical value. You can add simple Flashing noise to the numerical value. We have some sort of categorical data like cancer or arthritis, you might be able to make some random flips that, that allows you to switch between these categories and you can't quite. There, there might be some correlation. I, I'm not aware of all the, all the expansions to the this. Classification of these but, these. So the, the thing is when you start flipping cancer to, to arthritis or something like that, my view is you're really destroying a lot of the data. Exactly. Um, and and my, I think that you can't really Know, release um, useful data without really? without any fear of um, being able to identify the patients. And this is not something that will actually ever be um, something we'll be able to do. Yeah, actually, if you're changing that, then the data won't be much of any use. Exactly. So you, have, you have to balance that. The more you obscure it, the more queries you can ask, but the further it is from reality. Right? So it's, it's a trade off. And, it's, and my view is that the trade off is too far that if you are going to guarantee anything useful about the individual patients, you've lost any useful information about the data. Um, you can do some very high level statistics, like what is the overall, so even if you include the, the, the overall mean of something, you can, you can sometimes recover some, some individual things from that because you can go and, ask, go and ask everyone in the study and you say, like, what is the average um, like if you looked at some some indicator of cancer or some like maybe was the average number of um, like 
on like white blood cells or, or something that's, I don't know, something that's an indicator. You look at the average, and you ask a lot of people who you know are in the study, and theirs are all saying it's not cancer, but you know the average was such that there was some, someone who must have had cancer, right, in this data set. Then you can figure out, if you ask, find enough people that don't have cancer, then you can infer that a lot of the other people probably do have cancer, even without asking even just by knowing that they were in the study. And so there are, you know, there are lots of issues with this, and I'm not very optimistic that this will ever work. So that's part of the reason why I didn't, didn't spend more time talking about this, but um, it's, it, it's, it's a really, it's still an inter really interesting line of research, and I think it, that's partially because it, it really relates to a lot of the other problems. It's kind of an opposite view of if you have noisy data, what can you recover? And this is saying, if you have non-noisy data, how can you obscure it so you can't recover it? It looks like the recovery techniques are winning, which from a day mine perspective is good. From a privacy releasing data perspective, it's bad. Um, but so it's, you know, all this, this the, the foundations of all these things are being connected from different viewpoints. Okay, uh, that was, that was a, a good question, and uh, yeah, okay, so back to this. How do we, okay, so, so um, who's heard of overfit? Okay, about, about half of us, and who's not heard of overfit? Okay, and who didn't answer? <laughs> okay. Uh, there, there's some people who didn't answer all three of those times. So, uh, <laughs> but some people answered twice that you, you could have covered up for someone. Uh, um, okay, so let me give a, a brief. So, so, so I'll, I'll talk mainly about. So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about with respect to ridge regression and lasso, because that's closer to what we're doing. But it's often described in terms of things like linear regression. Right, so if you have if you have data points like this, right, you're trying to fit, you're trying to do some regression with this. You know, the a, a good choice might be to do um, some linear regression, so you get this line which goes through here. But I, I mentioned there was a trick you could do where you could uh, you you could take all of the the coordinates 